So we're moving on now to the last long paper of, of our session this evening. And this will be presented by Trafford Bansal, and it's called Ask the Guru, Multitask Learning for Deep Text Recommendations. Hi, everyone. I'm Trapit, and today I'll be telling you about new work using deep learning and recurrent neural networks to learn text representations which can achieve state-of-the-art results in cold start recommendations. This is joint work with David Belanger and Andrew McCallum at UMass Amherst. So in many application domains, the items to be re re recommended to users are associated with text. And these include research papers, news articles, blog posts, social media posts, movies with plot summaries, etc. In particular, in this work, we focus on research paper recommendation. So let me start by laying down the problem of research paper recommendation and give you some background related to work in this area. So what you have is a matrix of users and papers, where users are represented as rows and papers by the columns, and you observe some likes given to papers by users. And what you want to do from these sparsely observed likes given by users to papers is to generalize to the, generalize to the unobserved values and make decisions about what papers the users like or do not like. And the way you do this in standard matrix factorization-based collaborative filtering is to say that you represent the users and the papers by vector embeddings. And you define the uh, rating to be the dot product between the user and the item embedding. Obviously, you need a cost function to train these models. And that's generally the negative likelihood of the observed training data. Uh, in particular, for implicit feedback like research paper recommendation, uh, you would weigh the positive examples more than the negative examples to signify uncertainty in the unobserved values. The particular optimization algorithms that we'll use in our models will be based on stochastic gradient descent, where you will uh, sample um, many batches of positive and negative examples. Now, a problem that occurs in these recommendation systems is that of cold start, which happens when there's a new paper in the system. This corresponds to an empty column, so there are no likes on these papers. And consequently, there's no vector embedding for this paper to be recommended. And the way, uh, one way to tackle this problem is to say that you have a feature encoder which takes as input a document and produces a vector embedding for the paper. Uh, so you replace the vector embeddings by some feature function f. For example, you might want to extract bag of words features from your text. You can also extract tfidf feature vectors from the text of the paper or you can extract uh, topics from the paper using an LDA-based topic model. Or you might throw all of these features extracted from the text into a regression-based latent factor model. Our approach to this problem will also be based on such kind of a uh, feature function, uh, feature encoder, uh, to handle cold start recommendations. Uh, now, there's a lot of related work that could be mentioned here, but let me talk briefly about some of the main uh, papers, which are quite related to what we have done. So collaborative topic regression is a probabilistic model uh, which simultaneously models both the rating data and the text of the papers. And here, the feature encoder can be broken down into two parts. One, you have a paper-specific embedding, which is similar to collaborative filtering. And then you also have this distribution over topics for the, uh, for the paper's abstract. So you can view collaborative topic regression as a multitask learning model, uh, which simultaneously models uh, both the rating data and the bag of words distribution of the text. I'll talk about later why multitask learning is a good idea and how it helps recommendation systems. A note, however, that LDA is a bag of words model, and so collaborative topic regression is also limited to bag of words sufficient statistics. Uh, another recent work is collaborative deep learning, where you again have this formulation where you have a paper specific embedding. And then the second part is the final layer of a denoising autoencoder, which is trained to reconstruct a bag of words representation of the text. Uh, so note here that uh, all of most of the recent most of the work for uh, hybrid recommendation in this area is big, is based on models which uh, leverage bag of words sufficient statistics. So what we do here instead is we look at deep learning based models for learning feature representations, which are sensitive to the order of the words in the text. And for this, we look into recurrent neural networks. Uh, recurrent neural networks are, the, are these deep learning models which are excellent encoders of sequential data, and have achieved state of the art results in a variety of domains including language modeling, machine translation, parsing, name-mentor recognition, to name a few. And the way recurrent neural networks work is 
say you have a sequence of text that you want to represent as a vector. Uh, you will consume the text sequentially, so you have an embedding for the first token. You apply some nonlinear transformation to the embedding to obtain the first in the state representation. Then for every subsequent token, you again represent the tokens as an embedding. You apply some transformation to the current embedding and the hidden state representation you computed at the previous step to obtain the hidden state representation at this token. And you do this sequentially for all the tokens in your text to obtain hidden state representations at each token, which are informed by the content you have seen so far. However, a problem that these Valina RNNs have is that of vanishing gradients, which makes it difficult to learn long-term dependencies between the input and the output. And so long short term memory and gated recurrent units are special architectures which help overcome this problem. In these, in these architectures, you replace phi, the transformation function, with a more complicated function with gates, which can adaptively learn to remember parts of the input and the output, parts of the input sentences. In particular, in this work, we'll focus on using gated recurrent units. So coming back to this problem of text recommendation, the idea is to have a feature encoder which learns an order-sensitive representation of the text, which would be useful for recommending these items. And the way we do this is by taking the feature encoder to be a recurrent neural network, which will take in the abstract of the paper and convert it into a vector representation of that paper. So let us look at the architecture of this RNN in more detail. The, uh, so what we have is a, a layered RNN with uh, gated recurrent units. The first layer is a bidirectional layer, which is essentially a forward and a backward RNN on the input sequence of words, whose hidden representations at each token are concatenated and then fed as input to the second layer. The hidden representations that you get at the final layer are then all pooled together using some pooling operation. In particular, uh, we use average pooling to obtain a text representation G. Now, in addition to this text representation, we keep a paper-specific embedding, uh, which is added to this representation to obtain the final embedding F. Note that the paper-specific embedding will only be present during warm start scenarios and will not be present during cold start recommendations. I will now introduce and motivate this concept of multitask learning for this problem. So suppose you have related tasks that you want to model. Then one way is to have separate, separate networks or models for each of the tasks. Multitask learning, on the other hand, is this idea that if you share parameters between all of these related tasks, then you generalize better by providing regularization to the model and you also provide useful inductive bias from each of the other tasks. Multitask learning has been around in recommendation systems for quite a while. And it's particularly useful in recommendation systems because the data that uh, recommendation systems observe are highly sparse, where you typically observe less than 1% of the entries in the user item rating matrix. So multitask learning helps in regularizing these models. And text is often leveraged as an auxiliary input auxiliary prediction task for regularizing these models. And some of the recent works that have used text as an auxiliary prediction task include using topic models or using RNN language models on the text. In particular, for the research paper recommendation problem, research papers are often treated with keywords or user-provided tags. However, these tags are not always present to be used as feature inputs for a recommendation model. On the other hand, they can serve as a useful auxiliary supervision task in a multitask learning setup because you can consider the tags as a very short summary of a paper. And a good encoder of the paper's abstract should also be able to predict the tags given to the paper. And so the idea here is to share the network parameters and the embeddings to simultaneously predict both the ratings observed and the tags observed on the paper. So this is what our overall approach looks like. And some of the highlights of this model are this, that it moves beyond the bag of first representations, and so it can leverage higher order sufficient statistics, which are useful for recommendation. It's trained end-to-end -end for recommendation, by which I mean that it consumes text directly as an input for feature learning, as opposed to defining some unsupervised objective on the text, which may or may not be useful for recommendation. Multitask learning helps ameliorate its sparsity and learns a better representation. Another point here is that you can still leverage unsupervised data as training data in order to pre-train your word embeddings and the RNN parameters. In particular, we use pre-trained embeddings on ACM abstract to initialize RNN word embeddings. There are a lot of other techniques like dropout regularization, et cetera, which are used to train these models, and you can look at the details for more, uh, look at the paper for more details or talk to me after the presentation. Let me now move on to describe the experimental results. First, the baselines we use. So we look at collaborative topic regression, which is a state-of-the-art model for recommending research papers. Next, we also compare with a simple linear model, which represents each paper by the sum of the word embeddings in that paper. The embeddings would again be trained for recommendation. We also implemented a multitask learning variants of both of these models to have a fair comparison. The metric we use is recall at M, 
which is the total number of, which is the fraction of the uh, papers actually liked by the users in, top, in the top M recommended papers. So we looked at two publicly available data sets collected from sites you like. Uh, this is an online website which allows users to create personal libraries by saving papers to their uh, libraries. And users can also provide tags to these papers. The data sets have different sparsity statistics. In particular, one of the data sets is highly sparse with less than 0.1% of the entries observed. We do five full cross-validation and report the average scores. So let's look at the results now. Uh, we compare in both warm start and cold start setting and also for tag prediction. And let's look at first the models without multitask learning. Uh, we find that the R and N based models uh, outperform both the baselines. In particular, for cold start recommendation, the performance boost is huge. Uh, another interesting thing to note here is that the simple uh, linear model embed performs uh, competitively to the collaborative topic regression model, particularly in cold start setting. Let's look at the multitask learning models now. Uh, the comparison is similar with a huge performance boost in cold start scenarios. However, in warm start, the results are a bit more mixed, with collaborative topic regression performing slightly better when it does multitask learning. The interesting thing to note here is that multitask learning helps, um, uh, helps in improving the performance of each of the models compared to the variant which does not do multitask learning. These results are for recall at 50. We also vary the number of recommendations in the recommendation list and obtain essentially a similar kind of comparison. Uh, in particular, for warm start, we find that uh, the RNN-based models uh, give recommendations which are better at the top of the recommendation list, but the scores become more mixed at the end of the recommendation list. Often people say that deep learning models are black boxes, and you cannot really uh, interpret what, is, what's, what the models are learning. However, this is not entirely true, and there are simple methods that one can use to, to understand what the models are really learning. For example, given a paper being recommended to a user, you can take the derivative of the recommendation score and backpropagate the derivatives down to each token of, of the word embeddings. Uh, the norm of the gradient at each token gives the leverage of that a token in the final prediction score. And when you visualize this, and you can visualize this leverage to understand what's really important in the abstract of the paper being recommended. And when you do that, you get something like this. So you find that the model finds phrases of words as important, for example, maximum likelihood, and iteratively reweighted least squares. Uh, the model also learns to assign importance to words uh, based on its context. So, example, so for example, likelihood is less important than when it appears uh, with, maxim, with the word maximum. Um, you can also see that it learns to uniformly ignore you know, stop words and punctuations. So we demonstrated a first result in using uh, deep learning for learning text representations for cold start recommendation. And deep learning works if used appropriately. When deep learning really shines, it's in learning rich feature representations from a variety of structured data, like text or multimodal data. And there are many research directions in this area which are of interest to us. For example, how, you, how would you incorporate a different kind of structure in research paper recommendation problem, like research paper citations, and model these problems of reviewer paper matching? How to incorporate multimodal data which is common in social media and reason about it simultaneously for making recommendations? How to make sequential recommendations incorporating user feedback? How to make end-to-end -end dialogue systems which can um, provide interactive recommendation and seek actively? Uh, over the past few days, there's been a lot of discussion on challenges for deep learning and recommendation systems. Some of the major highlights have been sparsity, which is highly important in recommendation systems. And we saw that there, uh, it is particularly important also for deep learning models because they're known to be prone to overfitting. But we saw there are methods like multitask learning which can be used to help address these problems to some extent. Interpretability is another major concern. And there are some simple methods which can be used to understand what the models are learning to some extent. And more research in this direction would really be useful. Computational efficiency is another major concern. Uh, however, there's a lot of research in deep learning on how to make these models more efficient, both in terms of compute time and in terms of memory, so that they can fit into your mobile devices. In the end, I would like to leave with the thought that instead of asking the question of whether deep learning would disrupt recommendation systems, we should focus on whether how there could be a synergy between deep learning and existing recommendation systems research. And I view this work as a very small step in this direction. Thank you.
So, um, have we any questions? So I'll start again, and thank you for a very comprehensive uh, presentation of your, of, of your work. And as I understood from your presentation, there are three elements that seem to make everything work. One is using a sequence of words rather than a bag of words. The other is using recurrent neural networks. And the other is multitask learning. Of, of those things, which, which do you think, like, the combination of them obviously has yielded the results you have. But which do you think is, is most important or critical? Um, like I if, guess, I, if I was yeah. to take a non your network approach but use word sequences. I guess both contribute to some extent. So if you have a rich enough model which can utilize the sequence uh, of the words in the data and can learn a rich representation from that, then that's, that by itself is enough if used properly with re regularization and dropout and things like that to learn a good representation. So we observed that the results already improved with, uh, without multitasking, multitask learning, but then multitask learning also helps uh, in improving the results by providing additional regularization and good inductive bias. And in particular for like simpler models, like topic models, you observe that it improves quite a bit more than it does for the RNN-based models. Okay. And, and do you feel, from, from the, your interpretability approach that you presented there, that your results are as interpretable now as a topic model or as, as some non, non your network approach? Uh, that's a difficult question to answer, but so topic model is also like a simple model, and so it's, it's easier to interpret naturally, but uh, you but, but being a sequence model, being able to say that this is the set of words, like a sequence of words, which, is, which has a high leverage on this particular recommendation, is something that's, that you cannot do with a topic model. And so that's also interesting. And there could be other ways of interpreting these recommendations scores, and like, we are just scratching the surface of this right now. Okay. I suppose the, the, the last question that's in my mind is one that which you brought up there at the end as well, the efficiency question. How yeah. long does it take to fit the fit the model and also, I suppose, to decide what the model is. Like, there's, there's a lot of modeling choices you have to make. Yeah, in, that's a good question. Your... So, it, uh, it takes time to train. You train it on a GPU, obviously. Um, it, it takes about as much time uh, to train as a single thread version of a collaborative topic regression model, um, which does not use a GPU. Um, but it takes time to identify a good set of parameters too. So either you do, either you have, either you work at like Facebook and you have like a million GPUs to throw throw your model at, and you learn a good set of parameters, or you train it manually and like look at where your training loss is going. And so it takes time, a few days at least, to understand uh, what's a good set of parameters which can achieve a good result. Okay. Have we any other questions from the audience? Yes, one over here. Hi, thanks for the talk. There's one thing that bothered me on the results chart. I might not be very uh, familiar with the recall metric, but is it normal that the cold start results metrics are uh, significantly larger than the warm start ones uh, across the board? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So the reason for the difference here is that uh, what I do for warm start is I take the entire training data, so like the entire set of documents in the, train, in the data, and like rank over all of them. So it's a much larger list that you're ranking over, which is why you get a, like a smaller score, which is somewhat different than what some of the baselines uh, do, where they take an explicit split of the positive and the negative examples and just rank over that split and not the entire set. So that's the reason for the smaller uh, number. Thank you for that question. Okay, thank you very much for your talk.